Okay, this is Greg McHugh. Uh, Greg has been uh, over 23 years combined experience as psychotherapist and hypnotherapist and is a board certified level four regression therapist. He has been an instructor in hypnotherapy credentialed by the Colorado Department of Higher Education and has taught regression therapy, spirit releasement and gestalt therapy as applied hypnotherapy. He now teaches the principles of his recent book, The New Regression Therapy. It's a really good book. Uh, and what you say? Show you. you want to see the book? Sure, so hold up the book. It's a good book. Now use it to grab the phone. Um, and offers mentoring uh, yeah, to therapists and students who want to learn the approaches of that modality. Greg is an honorary lifetime member of the Colorado Association of Psychotherapists and co-founder of the Golden Portal Institute. Greg believes his work to be one, to help into, he help into healing those who come suffering with acute or chronic mental and emotional conflicts, and two, to assist those who truly want to grow in realizing spiritual union within. <clears throat> Both involve listening and helping to elicit a living healing process from one's own interior resources that fulfills the intention and ideals for clearing and growth. Greg has a practice in Denver, Colorado, and for information about his book and about his training, his other publications can be found on at, um, I probably should put this in chat, it's www.newregressiontherapy.com and www.gregmchugh.com. Those are his websites. Okay, that's it. I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Thanks, Kiki. Okay, this will be fun, I think, because there's so much here <clears throat> and there's so many intricacies involved in um, entities attaching to us or energies coming. <clears throat> so I'm going to be very basic at first and then we'll go into some of the, the complications that take place. And this is mostly from my, my text um, beginning on page 109. So I'm not just going to read it. And um, the the basic uh, concept here, whether you've had experiences spiritually around death or not, and have recall or not, is that there's a normal uh, pathway for humans when they, when they die, and that is to go into the heaven worlds and into the white light. Now, this process may occur very abruptly or gradually, it depends on a number of factors as to how quickly uh, a person's spirit leaving the body enters into that realm of the heaven worlds. The heaven worlds are a state of unconditional love. There it is, uh, if you ever tapped into it in any way, you know how wonderful and awesome that love is. It permeates uh, the life between lives and that journey. And uh, its availability is there for all who leave and leave their bodies and leave the planet. But many of us get stuck on, on the journey and don't go there. We have incarnations that are somewhat incomplete where we're still stuck in the earth zone or in some other in-between place and don't really enter in to the light and the heaven worlds. But the normal pathway <clears throat> for a person upon their death is to rise up, lift up and start to feel that presence, that divine love or see that light and begin to experience uh, automatically a surrendering within themselves into that presence. And then uh, in the interlife, as some of you who've studied that, um, that work, that area, there are a number of stages that can take place 
of uh, education, training, uh, reunion, joy, uh, learning that can take place in the heaven worlds. Often when a spirit leaves the body and they rise up, they'll enter into a light and they may encounter a party, <laughs> literally, a party of people, some of whom they've, they've never seen before, who are there welcoming them. Excuse me, just a minute. Gracie. That's my dog. And, um, and these people are part of the, the group and the receiving by the divine of that deceased uh, person's presence. Hold on, I'll be right back. Grace, Gracie, come here, come on, that's good. Then upon being received in the light, <coughs> The person goes through different processes that have to do with reviewing the life they left, coming to understandings uh, about their learnings, and maybe they'll disappear for a while into the depths of the heart of the divine. And, and then go through specific trainings that are uh, germane to their kind of history and assignment, and then uh, have uh, an orientation towards re-entering or a reincarnation. That reincarnation is, uh, that, that orientation is called the planning period or planning stage. By that time, the, the, uh, the spirit of the person is without a physical body. And generally by that period, they are involved in physical consciousness at all and may not have any recall per se about the life so-called that they left, but their soul knows. Now, um, then there are other journeys that they go through in preparation for coming back into the next incarnation. I wanna suggest that um, in all of this, it, what I'm describing is a rather linear process. You die, you go up, say hi to God, you greet your friends, and you learn a little, and then you come back. <laughs> that, that's kind of the way it is, in a way, but it's all at the same time. It's all happening right now, and that's a concept that... Uh, is important to grasp at some point in through your own experience. Now, um, when a person goes into the light or enters into the heaven worlds, they carry with them the issues, the themes, even the trauma that they experienced in that life in the body. And those impressions of the trauma and uh, the issues are called sanskara, S-A-N-S-K-A-R-A. -A. And it's a Sanskrit term for impressions on the soul. Um, and I, I talk about it a little in the book. And those are like templates, vibrational templates they have coalesced around experiences that they've had in the in this life and those sanskara or impressions tend to be uh, what contributes to the next incarnation which we carry forward into our next experience in in a body on earth understanding that uh, that concept of impressions on the soul can be very helpful if uh, in, in therapy, because you can invite, and we'll get to this another time, invite the
the healing presence that you're going to work with, uh, divine presence, to touch the person, the client, in the interlife, in that whole sanskara, which causes uh, tremendous healing and shifting in, in the life they just left and for uh, lives to come. Because the sanskara are transcendent. They, they incorporate whole realms of experience and lifetimes. They're not just a trauma event that took place that needs to be healed. Although very often that is what is occurring is a major trauma that's carried forward. Okay, now uh, we'll get to some of this in greater detail in a little bit. So I wanna talk about the abnormal pathway uh, following death. That would be where people don't go home. And, and what does happen? Home referring to returning to that unconditional love in the heaven worlds. And some people get frozen in the place where they died, especially if there was uh, uh, violence, an attack, wartime, they may find themselves stuck. When that happens, <clears throat> The next incarnation, which is the soul continuing uh, to generate experiences for itself and for God, the, the next incarnation, that person may find themselves um, stuck emotionally in a certain manner. And if you make inquiry and do regression, they'll uh, show you and themselves where they were killed or where they were stuck in that that death and did not go on into the light. So people may die um, in a somewhat natural manner, but still get stuck in different places. <coughs> the, the, the places are generally a state of consciousness that they died in, that they carry into the experience out of the body. I'll give you an example. There was a client who uh, was disabled in his uh, in the life that he visited, <clears throat> and he was pretty pretty disabled, physically contorted, and his sense of himself uh, having been rejected by the world was pretty despondent. You might say he was in a permanent state of despondency. He did have a family. He had a couple of children and a wife, but eventually one day he just gave it up and he went out into the woods and curled up into a fetal position and died. He stayed in that posture in his spiritual bodies for a long time. And then uh, one day there was the slightest movement of one of his feet. And at that, that light going off, an angel came down and lifted him up and took him home. And what he realized was that in the earthly life that he had left, that his son had been praying for him all this time. And it was those prayers that helped him transit, leave the stuck place that he was in. There was still uh, healing that needed to happen, of course, to the pattern of despondency, but his ability to let go of that, being stuck in that place and then rise up was a, a huge deal contributed to by his own child. Sometimes when people die, they don't want to go into the light. They may feel unworthy of it. They or sense the unconditional love that's there. And they may say no and reject the light. Or I'm not worthy 
you don't want me. That's kind of a common um, report that people give in uh, interviews upon their death and why they chose not to go home. Because they will say, well, I mean, if you knew what I did and all the bad things that I did and the people I killed and, and the, the people that I maimed and, and the hatred I generated, you would know why I am not worthy of that life. And then those of you who have worked in this field know that that light carries unconditional love. Doesn't mean that the person uh, has not, does not have healing to come to, but the, that love is totally unconditional. So there are different ways of working with that. I'll get to those in a minute. Another process of, about the abnormal uh, pathway following the death is when a person gets stuck in a particular place uh, in, in wartime. And there's usually a lot of chaos and violence emotionally that's going on in wartime and resentment and bitterness. And I've been cheated by uh, you know, losing that life, so forth. And um, when a person is in that state, it's generally the pattern that they have brought with themselves into the death. So that while the death may be shocking and very uh, traumatic in and of itself, it's not really isolated in consciousness from how that person has lived their life. So um, it, to, to alter or bring healing, for the client, it's possible to intervene with the divine presence into the death experience. So if a person finds themselves as an earthbound spirit, someone who is visiting your client and they have issues about how they died and, uh, <clears throat> and they're pretty stuck in it. If you invite divine presence into the death experience, that they had, it will cause that negative state. That's a misnomer really, but, but that state that they died in to dissolve. Then they can feel the natural response within their own heart uh, to the divine presence wanting them to come home. <clears throat> now this to me, when I discovered this was just astonishing. You know, there are lots of ways that uh, over the years that people have learned to go back and clear a death experience by revisiting it and uh, being in the feelings and, and visiting it several times, which can have a significant effect. But the simplest way is to invite divine presence to touch the deceased who's attached to your client in the death experience, even using just that language, and you access whomever you have a relationship with, God, Jesus, Mary, uh, I use Elijah, there are many that are great beings waiting to come and to uh, respond to your request to free that person from the stuck consciousness of the trauma of that death and thereby they can go home and, and leave their attachment to your client. Now, um, there are of course, uh, lots of variations on the theme of deceased humans attaching to us. The basic principle is that when someone dies and they attach to us and they don't go home, into the light, they bring into our field the state they died in. So if a person was depressed, so killed themselves, the client that they attach to may start feeling suicidal. And if they're vulnerable, may haul off and 
attempt the suicide themselves. I'll tell you a, a kind of a unique story. Uh, this was in the papers years ago, he said, <laughs> but it's documented in the book that uh, this man went uh, in, in a state of depression. He was married and feeling pretty miserable and went out in the barn and shot himself at Petka. And so then uh, shortly thereafter, another person, male, who was needing a heart transplant, received that uh, suicide victim's heart in a transplant. And, uh, and then 12 years passed and the transplant was successful and the new owner of the old heart, you might say, felt so grateful over the years about the heart of this guy who had committed suicide. So he looked up the, the wife of the former heart owner, if you can follow me, and they met and they fell in love and they got married and he went out behind the barn and blew his brains out. He entered into the same state of depression that was in the consciousness of the heart that he had had transplanted into his chest cavity. Interesting. Now, uh, sometimes uh, earthbound spirits or deceased humans will attach to us with a specific agenda. You find this often with uh, the grandparents or parents of children that are still living. And the grandparents were raised in such a way that there was uh, abuse and, and they weren't safe. And so if we look at their grandchildren, they wanna make sure that the grandchildren are safe and don't have the same uh, abusive experience that they're afraid they might have. And so they will attach to the child or to the, their own child, who is the parent of the child, and occupy their mind, and, and sometimes to extreme degrees, but often in a very controlling manner, which is fear-based. Trying to keep uh, the child protected and safe. So the healing for that can be brought by bringing uh, healing to the experience that the deceased who's attached had when they were a child. This again can be done in a, a simple manner, but sometimes it needs some uh, investigation into the trauma events that took place for the one who's now deceased and attached <clears throat> when they were a child. Again, uh, um, I don't want to sound like repeating the tape, but I am. If, if you invite divine presence into that attached deceased human's childhood experience, you will bring enough relief and healing so that the deceased no longer needs to stay with your client or they may realize what they've been doing and the client may realize how uh, they may have kept them there there may have been a symbiosis of about wanting protection so there are a number of situations <clears throat> that can occur any any variety where you have a deceased human attaching to your client. You may have other deceased humans attaching to the one that's attached to your client. So there may be a number of sequences that you, you need to go through in clearing of the death experiences that the deceased humans have had. Often um, you may encounter that there are dark ones, demons who attach to the vulnerable states of the deceased human spirits, let alone uh, to the, the client themselves. And we'll get into that 
uh, separately. So dark beings are demons that ha they have their own existence and it's dependent upon their, uh, you might call it, their venture of trying to, to pursue their avenue of revenge for feeling that they've been betrayed. <clears throat> In the course of the work that I've done, from time to time, I've done interviews with dark ones that show up. Now, how do they show up? Well, we're, we do different metaphors to identify them. There are different uh, protocols that you can use. One uh, very simple protocol is uh, the client starts describing a feeling that they're having in the chest and it's depressive. And you can ask the client, you know, to care, call forward that depressive feeling and ask it what it wants. If it's a dark one, it'll say something like F you or the death of the client or to bring them down. In other words, totally negative response. So when you're encountering this, the simplest thing is to check out, <clears throat> clarify that it is not a deceased human, but a dark one, or it may be dark ones attached to a deceased human who's then attached to your client. Generally, uncovering dark beings and demons is a simple process, but when it gets complicated is when uh, there have been trauma that the attached entity, the deceased human had, that made them vulnerable for the dark ones to enter in. And there may have been an agreement between the dark one and the deceased human. And those agreements may go back many lifetimes and have been pr um, promoted by the dark one in each incarnation up until this one. So you need to find out. And the simplest way in this is to ask the dark one about the pre-existing condition. Was there an agreement that you made with my client? And how was my client vulnerable for that agreement, if so? And then you ask the spirit of the client to show you the vulnerable state where the dark one came in and made an agreement. And your client's spirit will show you. You can go to that vulnerable state, which is uh, often um, a very weakened state uh, due to other trauma in childhood and so forth. And again, using divine presence, you can bring healing to that vulnerable state. Uh, being specific, saying, I now ask Jesus to come and touch um, Martha in that vulnerable state she was in, <clears throat> in that prior life, with his love and healing presence. Now, and then you wait. And the dark one that was attached through <clears throat> an agreement lifts off the client, and the client may describe it for you clearly. Then you can have the angels of the white light completely envelop that entity, the dark one, and remove it up and out entirely, finishing the process and remove it into the appropriate place for it in the white light. <clears throat> and you may go, oh, sure, Greg, <laughs> what, what is this? Just remove it. Well, that's what takes place. If you ask it to, uh, be the experience for the client. Now, um, let's see. There are uh, often networks of dark beings. And sometimes when we're clearing out attachments, we see that there's a dark one there. We may not um, venture on beyond the presence of that one which I think is an oversight if, if we don't. And so we can ask, is there a network that you belong to, uh, Dark One, while you're attached here to Joan? 
And they'll, if there is, they'll say yes. And, and are there replacements in those networks? And the answer is usually yes. How many? Five, 10, 20, okay. And so then you use the angels of the white light to envelop all of those in the network of dark ones in, in a mesh of gold white light, removing them up and out of the field of the client, out of the client's universe <clears throat> into the appropriate place for them in the, in the white light. <clears throat> My dog agrees. So, um, now all of these protocols are in the book in a step-by-step -step fashion. Um, so th the theme is that, hold on a minute, this, Gracie. Thank you. Come in, lay down. That's Gracie, I don't know if you can see her. She's about 110. So um, one of the uh, amazing elements about working with attached entities and specifically demons or dark ones is that you can ask them anything and, if, and usually they understand the question before it's even asked about their presence, their purpose, and if there's an agreement, and they'll tell you. I think maybe one out of several thousand I've encountered are, are bold-faced liars. They, they are liars, but <laughs> they tell the truth at the same time. So when you ask them, uh, how long have you been attached here to my client? And they'll say, key words they'll say always forever those are clear indicators of dark beings or they may say just a while and it may be that they came in when the client was vulnerable that summer in a trauma that he or she was having and they'll tell you now sometimes you get some detail on uh, when they entered into that relationship and whether or not uh, there was a dependency or you might say codependency on the part of the client for the presence of the dark one. It's very uh, normal for children uh, to have dark beings attached to them. Children are vulnerable. They often in trauma with their parents or in their parents' uh, hell that they're living out and the child is left. And so the child will ask for help. Now they don't know who to not ask for. I mean, they haven't read the book, so, but they know that they need help. And so a dark one may show up and say, if I got a deal for you, I'll stay with you and then We'll see what happens. And so the child says yes, then maybe for a moment or a few days, they feel powerful and then it wears off, but the dark one is still there and manipulating them until it's released in some manner, which may be several lifetimes. The, the influence of, of dark ones, whether there's an explicit agreement or not is so pervasive in our world. I mean, if I had a, a magic wand of what I would want to do, it would be to clear them all out. And, um, but we often have uh, our own karma or difficulties in traps in the consciousness of the dark ones trying to manipulate us. Um, so there are sometimes dark ones that will show up that, uh, have, you know, like very grandiose sounding names like Satan and so forth. And if you have fear 
uh, about their presence, then you need to take care of the fear. It's not difficult. You can ask God to come, Archangel Michael, for example, and just say, okay, here I'm working with my client so-and-so, and I'm feeling fear. And usually, if you're experiencing fear in that uh, circumstance, it's the presence of a dark one in you that's generating the fear. Was the expression, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. And so you can uh, consciously and in a very practical manner, ask uh, the angels of the white light to come draw a mesh of light through your field, drawing up all that energy that may be fear that may not be yours in that mesh of light and removing it up and out of the field of your own field. And you wait for a few moments. <clears throat> and a, kind of a sub part in that is you want to have those same angels uh, retrieve the parts of your energy that may have been lost or scattered due to the former presence of the dark ones. Then you can go back to your client. All of this can be done under your breath and where it's a matter of intention and making explicit your acknowledgement of the different resources that you have. Okay, now um, there are lots of ways of working with entities that show up. There may be deceased humans that have dark ones attached to them. Then you need to use the protocols for clearing out dark ones out of their experience. Uh, check to make sure that there are no uh, unhealed trauma where the dark ones may have come in, like having an open door. Now, they, I want to talk a little bit about extraterrestrials. And I've had some experiences with them directly. Generally, um, there are two uh, types of situations. One is an extraterrestrial who may uh, be gray in their energy, hence they have the name grays, or um, a, a gray extraterrestrial who attaches, who has dark ones attached to, to it. So you can uh, have dialogue if you use a scanning process to identify the presence of a, uh, an extraterrestrial. Then you can ask to be shown, you know, what their purpose is and, and they'll tell you, but they're wrong, but they'll tell you just the same. For instance, they, uh, the greys will say, well, we want to understand humans. <laughs> oh, how kind of you, but they have no heart. No, none, nada, no heart. So how can someone with no heart understand you? Not possible. But if you investigate, you'll find out that they don't have a heart. And it may end up that you have to give them a lecture that you cannot understand humans until you get a heart. It's like if I ever had a heart or if I only had a heart. So, uh, years ago, I had, uh, an, can I say, a long process of clearing a gray out of a client. And uh, it was, it involved an intellectual argument with them because that's, okay, I see the question. That's what uh, was showing up, was their intellectual consciousness. And to try and persuade them to recognize that they did not have the means to investigate and observe and learn about humans because of the absence of a heart. So I just, I saw a message that Georgina flashed up here. Are all of them, are all extraterrestrials gray and so forth? And the answer is no. 
There are some that are bright and shiny and who are from different planetary systems, some of whom you may be familiar with. But the gray has to do with the consciousness of the entity that's reflected in their expression, in their bodies, so to speak. So I hope that answers the question. There are Pleiadians, you know, that are gold and bright and shiny and loving. And uh, they're totally dissimilar from gray uh, extraterrestrials. Okay. Um, Now, in, in working with uh, a client, it's important to, at, if you identify, or she does, the presence of something that's attached, <clears throat> it's important that you identify the vulnerable place that they were in, where this entity came in and attached to them. So that you, your objective is, to bring divine presence to that vulnerable state, which I mentioned uh, earlier a little bit. Uh, now there are situations that are common for intrusions by entities, a uh, death experience, suicide, war, uh, violence uh, between couples in marriage and violence upon a child growing up sexual assault, you name it. And wherever there's trauma that opens the energetic field of the client, no matter the age, doesn't matter. And that it's like, if you could imagine first that an energetic field around a person, an adult in the shape of an egg, you, you may have seen energies of this nature and there are different frequencies within that uh, egg. And when something happens that intrudes through that field, then the different frequencies, uh, uh, emotional body, spiritual body, mental body, and causal bodies, all of which may be torn or uh, injured, then parts of the energy of that person may uh, kind of lift away or be scattered. Which is why I always ask after bringing healing to the vulnerable experience where the attachment happened, that I need to address the, the presence of the attachment and its effect upon the client. So I wanna bring healing to the vulnerable state where trauma was. And then I wanna bring healing to uh, the, the eventual presence of the dark ones that were attached or a deceased human that may have been attached because their energies uh, get scattered away, lost and scattered out into the nether worlds. So you use the angels of the white light to retrieve those parts that were lost or scattered. All of this is very practical. And, and if you ask them to do it, they'll do it for you. If you don't ask them, there may be like an incomplete healing process that uh, continues on, even though you may have removed entities from being attached to your client. So these are what some people call mind fragments. These are parts of a person's energy that were lost or scattered in trauma or in uh, events that were just too much for them. And those mind fragments are often floating around in, in different states. And they may attach to a client and then you need to investigate them if they become identifiable as such as mind fragments, then you want to ask about the experience that they had when they separated out from the, their host. And um, splinter personalities are similar, but they're more, they're stronger than just mind fragments. 
So I had a, uh, a client one time who in a prior life was uh, living in Kentucky. It was like in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, married to a very abusive, violent man who sexually uh, messed with her beyond the pale and uh, part of her energy splintered off, separated out. You could call it an altar if you want. I think the terms are conflicting, but so that part uh, that splintered off from the client in that prior lifetime was identifying itself through <clears throat> the uh, interrogation with myself through the client in the session. And it described its experience of rising up above the client, witnessing further abuse uh, of the client, not of itself anymore, but, and then the death experience. And then it was left there without it being, uh, having a completed life experience. And then there was also the death experience that needed to be addressed. Gracie. So we had to bring healing to the trauma where that part splintered off that was showing up in the client's life in this day. And in so doing then, integrating it back into the soul of the client and then moving on from there. So sometimes you may have someone or something that's attached uh, to your client and, and they, there are a number of possibilities of what it may be. And you can always ask, just keep that in mind you're sitting there in your office and the client's going blah, blah, blah. And, and it's, it's confusing to you as to who's speaking or what's happening or the journey and the regression. Ask, you can always ask. And then the answers and probably guidance also will come for you. Sometimes there are objects that are implanted in a person's uh, etheric body. And it's usually done uh, by extraterrestrials. So when it's identified through a scan or the, the person uh, feels the presence of something and you go in and ask it what it is, there's a thought, you could ask something what it is, then <clears throat> it can be cleared out I had a client who we were doing a remote session for his brother. Remote is where uh, my client became surrogate for his brother. <clears throat> In the process of that journey, uh, the surrogate noticed in his brother's arm, his right arm, this object of some shape or size. And he asked the object, who put you here? And the object identified extraterrestrials had done it. So we called forward the consciousness and the presence of the entities, extraterrestrials, that had done the implant and uh, asked them to remove it. Kind of a direct question. And they were talking to each other, the entities the extraterrestrials and they looked at each other and they said why do humans always want that <laughs> to have objects we put in there removed this, that, that was this a quote anyway i thought it was rather hysterical um now a, a big thing that can be understood is curses Curses are a projection of desire for uh, destruction or pain or suffering to be placed on someone else. Most often, uh, curses involve the presence of dark beings who are manipulating the anger and vulnerability and victimization of 
the, of the client or the originator of the curse. Uh, it's normal for people who are practicing witchcraft or uh, black, black arts to want to have, at some point, they come in their life and they don't feel they have, have enough power. <clears throat> so um, they invite dark ones in to give them power. They'll have a temporary feeling of that power and find themselves being manipulated into establishing curses and doing uh, black arts, all of which is because they're not connected to their own power. So the healing of one who is perpetrating curses is to bring healing to that vulnerable state where they believed they did not have any power. Maybe they were being bullied. Maybe they were witnessing abuse of their mother by the father when they're like four years old and they were pissed off and, and scared at the same time. And they wanted to have some power to be able to do something. Or some other circumstance where they had a conclusive uh, belief in themselves as being powerless. And so when demons come in and offer them a means of feeling power, which is temporary, uh, and convincing them that they can do things to other people, then they become attached to that presence in them that's already manipulating them and providing curses. Curses are also generated from uh, generation to generation. And it's like an energy that's part of the dark one that uh, was involved in the initiation of the curse. So if you, you identify through working with a client that uh, if there's been a curse in their family for a long time, then you wanna ask that the angels of the white light, or you could ask Elijah to show you where this curse first took place. What was happening? Who was vulnerable in that ancestry? And show me how they were vulnerable. And so usually it's trauma and uh, the, the earlier incarnation in that family of a client uh, feeling helpless, vulnerable and wanting help and had not read the book that they could call on God and get the help they needed even if they were Christians, so to speak. So curses can dissolve and are usually associated with a dark being attaching to the client and exploiting the client's fear and vulnerabilities and feeling that, and their belief that they're powerless. I, I, I think that I have not experienced anything contrary to that in general. Now, um, elementals or nature spirits are, are wonderful. And you may encounter them with the client or by yourself. Elementals are those spirits that are part of the uh, manifestation of, of things in nature. They construct, construct whole fields and structures of trees and forests and so forth. And sometimes they can be made available <clears throat> to the client. I have one client who works with trees and the trees tell them when to come and see me. <laughs> so who am I to doubt their wisdom? Okay, any questions right now so far? I'm sure there's a hundred of them. Okay, well, there's some questions that go back to earlier things you were talking about. Um, one interesting question is how does all this relate to the concept of ghosts? Okay, good question. A ghost is a deceased human spirit, <clears throat> died, left the body, did not go home into the light, maybe stuck, 
in a certain kind of consciousness or field or presence or, or attached to a place. I had, um, it's a fun story. I had a client who started taking two different um, medications, but when to address his uh, nervous issues and anxiety and, and digestion. And <clears throat> in the course of that, the, the combination of the two caused his spiritual sight to open up dramatically. So he soon realized that the townhome that he was living in, that he thought he was the only occupant, was filled with other spirits, ghosts. There were some who were frozen back in, in the in hippie days, uh, using dope, smoking dope, sitting around. There were others that were playing golf. It was right next to a golf course. There was uh, a, uh, a group of Muslims who were all uh, adoring this one uh, leader of their country who had died. And when he died and they died, they followed him. So in effect, they were all ghosts. They were not in a physical body. And um, oftentimes ghosts are confused. They don't know where they are, but deceased humans fit into that category. So uh, I was having dialogue with this uh, Muslim leader, this deceased Muslim leader, who explained how all his adherents had followed him uh, upon their deaths into where he was. And I tried to point out to him that he wasn't in heaven. And he went, oh, and I had him come into an experience of the heaven worlds and the light. And I said, do you wanna go there? Yes. And do you want your friends all to come with you? Yes. So we set up a stairway and a door, so forth. And he stood there proudly, opened the door and called them all in to go up the stairs into the light. True story. Okay, here's another good question. Um, where do the dark ones come from? What is their source and can they be redeemed? Yeah, I would say redeemed uh, it is not quite the right understanding of what's possible for them. I'll try to explain this. Uh, the, the dark ones come out of the same place that all of us did. At some place and, and some time, although you have to pretty much throw out time and space, dark ones were energies or beings who came out of the Godhead in an emergence as we did, as souls. But when they came out, almost categorically, they got pissed off. Uh -oh. They entered a holistic state. Are you with me on that? You kind of lost your for a sec. Okay. Okay, so they entered into uh, a dualistic state and they were mad at God. And betrayal is a common phrase that they've used when I've interviewed them, which I've done. I know that sounds arrogant, but you know, how'd you get here? And so in that state of betrayal, they acquired the attitude of what and have pursued it ever since then. So their revenge is to get back at the God that kicked them out as they see it. Mm -hmm. So that's the source. Mm -hmm. And what you can do when you uh, encounter a demon, a dark one, is that you can interview them. And I've done this a, a number of times. There's nothing risky about it. So let's say you've identified one that's attached to your client. So then you can ask the entity, look in and tell me what you come to. And the demon will say something like uh, red, anger, 
color, um, chaos, any number of conditions that are not of the state of union. And then you say, or I say, go into the center of that chaos and tell me what you come to. And they do, it's amazing. They follow your suggestions and they go in and they have an experience of the next stage of the center of their own being. And what do you feel there? Uh, well, it's quieter and there's a light. Good, go into that light now, see what happens. And they do, they're actually, in effect, they're going into their own light inside. And so then they describe how they're feeling and it's wonderful. And then I say, would you like to go to a place uh, to recover all of yourself and reconnect with the depths of your own light and being? Would you like help with that? And they always say yes. And so you invite the angels of the white light to lovingly escort them into that place, which is a state that's within themselves in the first place. And so, and I've been told that uh, every time that we remove dark beings from being attached to a client, that that is a process that the angels of the light take them through what I just described uh, in the interview experience. So it's not really, um, it, it, what it is is uncovering their own being and then coming into reconnection with themselves. And it sounds oversimplified, but it's, it can be profound. Sometimes uh, the therapist can ex experience the divine love of God for this dark one who had been really messing with the client for eons. And, and it's so powerful and so extraordinary. And they eventually, uh, here's the word, subsume to it because it's, it's uh, hard not to. Now, sometimes we'll get, I'll do an interview, uh, helping one go back all the time to the point where they were sent out and they'll be real stubborn. They say, I'm not going back. And I said, well, that's all right. How do you feel about the client now? Oh, I'll leave him alone. So on. Uh, answer. That good? Okay, here's another one. Can a curse backfire and bring a dark one attaching to the person who sent the curse? Can a curse backfire and bring dark one attacking to, attaching to the person who sent the curse? Well, if the person is sending a, a curse, they already have dark ones attached to them or manipulating them from the from that initiative mm -hmm. and it may have been that the dark ones themselves had been with the person and previously attached and initiating uh, the idea of presenting a curse and bringing damage to the victims. Okay. So would bringing that divine light into the one who had the curse heal the person and get the dark ones out of them potentially? They, yeah, you can bring separate steps, ask them to show you where they were vulnerable. What happened that you entered into a curse? Well, this guy ran off with my wife and I'm not gonna have that happen again. You know, and he's pissed at his wife and the guy that, that did that. And so, in that vulnerable state of anger, the dark ones come in or, and they'll say, well, have I got a deal for you? And, and the person says, what is it? Say, well, let's get back at your ex-wife and your friend. And so that involvement uh, becomes perpetuated until it's cleared out. Mm -hmm. But the, the dark one was already there exploiting uh, the violent feelings of the the, the person they're attached to. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the next question is, is very much psychological about looking at psychosis bipolar one and the DSM. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Wanting yeah. to know if that, what, how that might be related to spirit attachment, if at all. Oh, very possible. Um, in, in the, uh, in the bipolar <clears throat> states, you know, the up and down that when uh, they're vulnerable is when the dark ones come in and may magnify the experience. I've had a number of clients who've come and said they have a diagnosis of bipolar. So that's the last time I have a discussion with them about what that means, but I ask them to describe their feelings and the patterns of experience they have in the feelings. And then we do regression into where the feeling was created or we ask the feelings themselves to say, what is it that you want? Now that, that comes from a protocol in, uh, uh, by Connie Ray Andreas called, uh, I can't remember, it's in the book, but it's uh, what you ask a part that was created out of trauma, mm -hmm. what it wants, and it can tell you what it wants and then you investigate it and it can lead you into a higher state mm -hmm. emanating out from that part in the first place. Uh, but if it says, I just want to destroy the client, then you know it's a dark one. Right. Just, you don't have to you know, question that because they're explaining themselves to you. So you do protocol for clearing of dark ones out of the consciousness and the in the field of the client. So we can open it up for anybody who has a question now. I'm gonna open the screen so I can see all of you and we'll take live questions. Anybody have any questions? Put your hand up if you do. I have a question. Yes, Anna. Uh, my question is how involved does the client need to be in the releasing of that entity? Do they need to be do they need to consent and do they need to be present? And no. when would you use a surrogate? Okay, so um, you can do a releasing of an entity from a client, if that's what you're asking about, um, remotely, not in the physical presence, just in, in your own chapel, your own bedroom, when you're praying for them or want uh, good things to happen. And you can use uh, blanket protocol language that's in the book, or you can use your own site and ask to be shown what's attached. Using a surrogate is um, uh, usually very helpful. Uh, years ago, I was working with clients and doing basically this work, but a little different. And um, they started asking me if I would do the clearing of attachments, one for her husband, another who uh, wanted work because he had a pattern he was stuck in, he couldn't get out. So I, I started doing it where I would go into a meditative state, then I would call forward the presence of the client, the spiritual presence, and let myself begin to feel how they were or are, feel their heart center, the solar plexus, and sink into that, relaxing into their presence. And as I did that, I became uh, aware of different elements and ways that they were being and so forth. <clears throat> so when the, the client um, may have presented a specific issue they wanted to have addressed, and so I would ask them, to be shown in effect where that was created. So I was doing regression for them. Uh, and then I decided, no, I'm not gonna do it anymore. <laughs> it's too much work to be the therapist and be the surrogate. So I started training surrogates and I have two or three that I've worked with for a long time. And, and it's wonderful because the, as the therapist, you don't have to be attached to the presence of the client or the issues, 
but you can be absorbing what's taking place in a, a, a more spiritual way and offered direction and guidance. Okay, let's go down here to this road and turn right and see what's uncovered. So surrogate work can be very fulfilling <clears throat> for the surrogate, let alone for the client. And excuse me, just a minute. And what I do when I'm doing that is I record the session and then send it to the client so they have that experience. Sometimes it helps them deepen into the healing experience that came about through the surrogate session. Am I answering your question? What about the ethics of doing a remote without someone's permission? Well, I have a standard answer. And that is that um, I will pray for anyone and anyone whenever it seems appropriate. And I pray for their healing and that God come and help them. And I think that's totally ethical, whether I have their conscious permission or not. Mm -hmm. There was one client I had, it was actually not a client, a student at a class who had an issue around that. Uh, and she had a lot of emotional baggage with that taking care of someone else in, in that manner uh, with or without permission and she became so hostile about it that I had to cancel the class and it turned out that she had uh, something attached to her that didn't want the promotion of the remote healing process to be developed and uh, so I cleared that entity out everybody's happy campers after i often get family members call and say my sister's possessed and this is what she does to me all the time and you know she's ruining my life and all this would you please do a spirit releasement on my sister how would you respond to that well uh i'd want to investigate the client's involvement with the sister and what issues that he or she may have first right and you know just do a general inquiry about it mm -hmm. and help them to come to see that there may be something that they could do for themselves yeah and i hear that with parents a lot too for their kids yeah well i think that's fine and then that if if a parent is complaining about their child then investigate you get the information and then uh bring the surrogate in and go into a hypnotic state, uh, meditative state, and call the child forward and see what shows up. And it generally will not be the issue that the parent is uh, suggesting is there, but something else that needs to be addressed that will help everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and in your surrogate work, have you worked with people who are psychotic or who are severely mentally ill? Have you done that? Somewhat. Anything? Yeah, I am. But it's, dif it's difficult because they're, they're locked into a, uh, uh, I would say, devolved state in a way through their experience with themselves. It's hard, but I've done some of that. Anybody else have any more questions? Yes, Deborah. Hey, Deborah and then Susan. One comment. Um, Greg, if I remember correctly, Irene Hickman, who you, you might have read some of her work with sur sure. surrogates, um, sure. uh, suggests that, that another avenue is to first check with the higher self of the person who you're communicating right. with. They may not be there, but connecting to the higher self of that person and getting permission from their higher self before furthering it. Yes, I, and I recommend that, that you do that. If, if the person shows up, this is what occurs. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get a request from a parent or a spouse or something to, to mm -hmm. bring healing to this one person. <clears throat> then we'll make a prayer, the surrogate and myself, that we be shown what needs to take place for their healing. 
then we go into uh, induction and into an altered state and we call forward the spirit of the client. So on rare occasions, do they not want to show up? Very rare. Almost all the time they'll show up sometimes enthusiastically, other times like, okay, I'll do this. You know, I had one uh, session years ago where I was wanting to do some healing work for someone and, uh, and we went into a, a state where we prayed and asked for assistance. And, and uh, when we called the client forward, he said, who the fuck are you? <laughs> and it turned out to be a famous person who didn't want to change his ways or anything. But that's what his response was. He knew that he didn't want to get involved. So we didn't do the work. Okay, Deborah had a question. Okay. And then so, Susan. So during um, times of soul loss or soul fragmentation, is do the dark ones come in and fill up the empty spaces? I, I was just wondering, how does that work? Because if your soul's not whole and complete. Um, yes, it's the, the state that the client is in when the fragmentation happens. That it's like you can think of a, a field, an energetic field that's got different layers for the different bodies of the client. And there may be holes in them or huge openings. Uh, and you know, imagine having surgery and the trauma has created a 10 doorway, an invitation for dark ones that want to exploit the vulnerability. When you have, I want to say this, when you have surgeries or clients have surgeries, you want to heal that field. You want to call back the parts that were lost or scattered in the trauma of the surgery, integrate those parts back in, ask the angels to come and smooth out that whole uh, energetic field of the client and then Go on from there. Hey, Susan? Yes, I'm curious of your approach when you know that you have a client that needs a spirit releasement. Do you talk to your client about that? Do you tell them what it is or do you just approach it like a regular session and just and do the work and let it kind of just evolve from there? Evolve. I, I let it show up rarely. I mean, I may be sitting there seeing the entity uh, that's attached or the energy of a dark one that's filling the room. But I, I don't say, don't you want to get rid of that thing? <laughs> I don't go there. <laughs> okay. Makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Oh, I have one more. Yes. Part one. Is courting, when someone says someone's courted you, is that the same thing as an attachment? It's like, well, cord. yes. It, in, in effect, that a cord is a, an energetic, it's like a piece of rope. Yeah. You know, uh, that, and like a married couple, there's a cord that gray and silver, and between myself and, the, and my wife. So when uh, when a cord is fed by anger or resentment or bitterness or pain, then it gets stronger. It, you're actually creating that. And so, which is often why we experience what's going on with the other in the relationship, not recognizing that we have a direct high speed internet line with their heart. <laughs> Great. There's, there's another question that came up on the chat. Um, could you explain fragments a little more? And is it different from splintered off parts? It's really how you want to uh, define them. My experience of splinter is where it's the personality that broke off from the soul in that prior life or in this one was really significant, substantive, 
could feel it. And fragments are parts that really don't have a sense of continuity or integrity to them. They're like snowflakes floating around in a blizzard. You know, they're there, you know, and they're cold and they all have different shapes and so forth, but they're not uh, integrated in any fashion to be able to be uh, defined uh, in personality. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Anybody Come. have more questions? <laughs> I think we're gonna close then. Well, okay. Thank you, Greg, okay. for your expertise. I just want to say- Your wisdom. Thank you. I just wanted to say that everything that is in the book pretty much places an orderly sequence of events that if you read about it will help you uh, have more understanding when you're working with clients. So there are other protocols and uh, different ways of approaching that are in English so you can follow them. Thank you, everyone. For thank you so much for showing up today. Appreciate it was great. So much. And thank all of you for showing up. <laughs> Hopefully we'll Yay. see you next month. It'll be in early December because we're going to kind of take a break around Thanksgiving time and uh, come and listen to these interesting lives that are out of the box for most of our practices. Be fun. Happy Halloween. Enjoy the, yeah, uh, right. Thank you. That was <laughs> I had your book for a long time and I just bought right now the ebook in my just five minutes ago. Good. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Wonderful work. Good. Hey, Easy to there. Well, Kiki, I, I want I want to know if Kiki's okay. Did she get disoriented because I was moving? Okay. No response. Your, it's okay. Take your mic off, Kiki. I can't hear you. All right, it was a family joke. For the most part, Greg, I was taking notes and I wasn't directly watching you. And if I started to feel queasy, I would look away. <laughs> okay. We should give your dog a certificate because right. evidently Gracie was pretty pretty <laughs> active today. Maybe <laughs> she wanted to go wild. Look at cats. I've yeah. had cats that were possessed. I know. <laughs> Everybody take care. Be well. Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you guys later. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.